Good evening and welcome to the COVID-19 update on channels television. I'm Millicent Walker. First, the highlights. Finally, Kogi State receives first installment of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines, the last state in the Federation to take delivery of its vaccines. Doctors in Ondo State call off two-month-old strike after government addresses some of their demands. And Uruguay and Paraguay record number of deaths attributed to P1 variant first discovered in Brazil. Again, Nigeria has recorded zero fatalities from COVID-19 complications in the last 24 hours, according to a data published by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and CDC last night. The center says no deaths have been reported in the past four days, and the toll still stands at 2,058. The country also recorded 135 new infections arise from yesterday's daily count of 82, including data from Kaduna State recorded over the last two days and a backlog of cases reported in Kwara State. The latest single daily figure was recorded in 11 states, including the Federal Capital Territory. According to the health agency, 47 people have been discharged, including 18 community recoveries in Kaduna State. While the country has carried out over 1.7 million tests, there are currently over 9,000 active cases in the country. On the number of cases still on admission, a breakdown shows that Nasarawa State has the highest number of patients still on admission, followed by the FCT, while over a thousand cases are still being treated in Ondo State. On the other hand, data from the NTDC shows states like Edo and Gombe states have five cases currently on admission. Zamfara State has a record of three cases, while Kogu and Sokoto states are reporting zero cases on admission. In Africa, there is a record of over 4.2 million cases, while more than 114,000 deaths have been reported on the continent, according to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, according to the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, vaccination remains one of the most important medical interventions for preventing illnesses, death and controlling the coronavirus pandemic. The agency explains that following the World Health Organization's approval of some vaccines for the control of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, including the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the vaccine currently being used in Nigeria is a Covishield brand, which is manufactured by the Serum Institute of India. The Covishield brand is used in over 71 countries, including the UK, Canada, India and Brazil. While the AZ vaccine has 76% efficacy rates against symptomatic COVID-19 and 100% effective in stopping severe infection, investigations reveal that there is no evidence of a causal link between the vaccine and blood clot formation. According to the report, there is extensive data showing that the vaccine is safe and effective and especially good at preventing severe illness and death from COVID-19 as has also been confirmed safe by the WHO. However, some side effects have been registered, and that is to include local pain around the injection site, fever, headache, and other mild symptoms. Well, so far, um, according to the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, vaccinations in Nigeria commenced a month ago. Priority has been given to health workers, while in interested Nigerians are being asked to register online to be vaccinated, apart from top public officials, including uh, the president and vice president who were vaccinated publicly to drive the vaccine acceptance. Uh, the vaccines have been shared among states according to the disease burden among the priority groups. And so far, uh, the total we're seeing uh, says that almost a million Nigerians have received the jabs of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And our Kogi state government has officially flagged off the vaccination of its citizens for COVID-19 after receiving about 16,900 doses with the pledge that no one would be deprived from taking 
the COVID-19 vaccines. The State Commissioner for Health, Dr. Haruna Saka, made the disclosure at the official ceremony, adding that it is also the resolve of the state government not to compel any individual in the state uh, to take it. The most awaited COVID-19 vaccines arrived the state from Abuja at about 7.40 p.m. yesterday. The commissioner also disclosed that the state government received uh, about 16,900 units of the vaccine and that another 16,900 is expected in the state in a couple of weeks. While the state hopes to vaccinate health workers, uh, followed uh, by the first-line workers like the police, the military, the NCDC customs officials, today's vaccination campaign saw some government officials in Kogi State take their jabs. Let's go over to Ondo State, where medical doctors and the payroll of the Ondo State government have suspended their two-month-old indefinite strike. The doctors embarked on the strike February 2nd this year to compel government to accede to their demands, some of which include the payment of salary arrears, payment of COVID-19 hazard allowance, insurance package for all health workers in the state and others. Addressing newsmen in Akure after its Congress, the spokesperson of the Ondo Government Doctors Forum says the doctors decided to suspend the strike due to the impact on the masses and the promise from government to address their demands. The strike became necessary because of non-payments, delayed payments, and fractional payments of our salaries and non-payments of COVID-19 allowance, and poor welfare generally, and poor medical infrastructure in our hospitals. It should be noted that the government has addressed some of these demands and concerns, and has pledged our commitments to others. However, there is still a lot to be done. But in consideration for, our, for the good people of Ondo states, and in trust that the government will keep our own parts of the agreements, the doctors in the states have unanimously agreed to return to work, thereby suspending the strike action. We hereby reaffirm, uh, reaffirm our commitments to continue to do our best and to render the best services Despite the daunting challenges that we are being faced with. Meanwhile, in Bayelsa State, the resident doctors at the Federal Medical Center in Yenagua are complying fully with the ongoing nationwide strike by the Nigeria Association of Resident Doctors, NART, since it was declared Thursday last week. A visit to the ever busy FMC Yenagua shows that only skeletal medical services are being rendered at the ever busy center. And to ensure full compliance, the executive arm of the union inspects the wards. NARD is asking the federal government to meet its demands, including the non-payment of allowances, among others. We're essentially here to monitor the compliance to the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors Industrial Action. It's indeed a sad one, very sad. And I see the great impact on the average Nigerian. It's, it's painful to see children helpless at the children's emergency ward. It's so painful to see helpless elderly people that can't assess care. Even if they come, how, many, how much care can they get? Because just a few consultants to the number of patients won't be able to cope. So here in FMC in Egoa, the compliance rate is 100%. It's painful, but that's our last two. Always remember we are not strike mongers. We don't love what is happening. We want the government to intervene and end this calamity on the poor Nigerian. According to the World Health Organization, strong economic growth will help reduce poverty, with 80% of the world's population in rural areas. But as Africa's population expands, estimated to reach 2.5 billion by 2050, the region faces a critical challenge of creating the foundations for long-term inclusive growth. Many countries still contend with high levels of child and maternal mortality, malnutrition and most health systems are not able to deal effectively with epidemics 
and the growing burden of chronic diseases. Well, these challenges call for renewed commitment and accelerated progress towards universal health. The health agency believes that the primary reason for investing in universal health care is a moral one, and it is not acceptable that some members of society should face death, disability, ill health, or impoverishment for reasons that could be addressed at limited cost. Well, joining us to talk more about this in our Lagos studio is Dr. Jonathan Dan Gana. He's a lecturer at Babcock University, the Department of Public Health, also Technical Advisor, Africa Health Agenda International Commission. Well, I should thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. All right. First, is universal health care coverage, is it possible in Africa? It, it is. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, universal health coverage is a reality and is achievable in Africa if we will have what I will refer to as concerted effort to see that um, it's a priority for all of us. So uh, it's more or less how much you prioritize it and then it becomes uh, what becomes achievable. Yeah. So another question is, does the coronavirus set us back or push us forward to achieving that? Uh, I think from that level to which I have been opportune to function at the African continent on the issue of um, COVID-19 uh, COVID and also um, universal health coverage, um, COVID-19 has brought a new dimension, which possibly in the planning and in the thinking of universal health coverage, we didn't think about. So there is actually a, a plus side of it, meaning that it has helped us understand that if we had solutions, then we need to start thinking of what happens if something we didn't envisage comes to play. And that is what coronavirus has, has brought before us. But that being said, uh, it has not brought a setback for us. I see it more like an eye-opener for us to be able to uh, make our effort more concerted. And then we have more strategic plans as to how we need to achieve what we have to. But, and, and that is looking at you know, the broader continent of Africa. In Nigeria, we have our teething problems. Yeah. Um, there's the strikes every now and again. There's health workers, immigration, uh, and there's br brain drain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. So, I mean, what are we doing to get this right uh, you know this is this is a this is a rude shock or a rude truth that um, I always love to shy away from uh, brain drain is is under increase you know when you check the statistics of the British government today um, you will realize that just in the year 2020 there are almost seven or about 8,000 Nigerian doctors who have moved to the US uh, to, 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 to the UK okay. And if you compare that statistics to what we had by the year 2006, we had barely about 2,000 people. And by the year 2017, you had, or 2016, you only had about 246 Nigerian doctors who have migrated. But just by the year 2020, you know, between 2019 and 2020, you had about 10,000 doctors. And that leaves us with, with more, more problem. You know, so it's like you were thinking of, um, I had a tuba of yam, to be able to take care of a family. And now the tuba of yam, you are actually left with a slice of yam. And then the number of people who need that same slice of yam has not changed. But the quantity of yam that you need has actually changed. So we, we, we need to go back to the drawing board as a country uh, and as stakeholders in, in various facets, both in the academia, both those in policy. Uh, I think it's high time we need to sit down and think of some deep-rooted questions as to why all of this is happening. The questions on the one hand, the same COVID-19 brought about governments crying for uh, more money, saying That's there right. isn't so much money. So essentially, is this practical, this universal health coverage? And, and this is as the WHO is warning how a lot more people are entering poverty and spending more uh, for health care. Yeah. You know, um, the reality is that if we do not take action, more Africans and permit me to contextualize it, more Nigerians will be pushed below the poverty line. You know, we, are, we have more people on the poverty line. And if we do not do what we need to do, more people will be pushed below the poverty line. So that leaves us with more societal problems. That leaves us with more societal ills that we may not be able to have all the apparatus that we need to be able to address all of these problems. 
I'd like to appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you Jonathan, a lecturer at Babcock University, Department of Public Health. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you so much. We have more on the COVID-19 updates when we return. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Hesitancy to the COVID-19 vaccination still appears to be a factor in the pandemic fight. With limited doses available to fight transmission in Africa, reaching herd immunity might be a difficult task when the bulk doses finally arrive. Joining us, pharmacist Augustin Ajijelek. He joins us uh, right now on the program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Millicent. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Tell us, what are some of the trends, the conspiracy theories that you've come across since vaccination started? Yes, uh, I've actually uh, found some people believing that there are microchips uh, embedded in the vaccine that will be used to monitor people's movement, violate uh, people's privacy. I've also heard those who are uh, students of the Bible, some of them are saying that this is another way to bring about 666. And some have even been claiming that this will modify people's DNA and uh, cause problems for their offsprings that are yet unborn. Uh, I've also heard others saying that when you receive that particular uh, vac vaccine, uh, you develop certain symptoms and you'll be having certain irregular movements and so many others, uh, it's almost limitless, uh, the number of myths we have heard about this. Uh, previously on this program, we've discussed some of them, and those things are still there. So those are a few of the ones that are still in circulation. So some states are reporting more acceptances with the vaccinations that have been received, while others are not. What can governments do further? to sustain the, the COVID-19 vaccination as they work towards herd immunity? Yes, um, as it stands, it's a tall order to achieve that herd immunity because most estimates have put it between 60 to 70% to achieve it. And for the differences in the states, it's actually a function of the level of engagement with the various stakeholders uh, across uh, disciplinary lines, across sectoral lines, across jurisdictional lines. Uh, across faith lines and so on. So it's a product of the engagement. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Channels TV has commendably done a very good job in terms of relentlessly giving information to the general public about this. And so also, uh, the various states have actually given varying uh, supports, uh, degrees of support to this particular endeavor. And what needs to be done is at every state level, at every local government level, and if possible, at community level, there should be an interface between the health workers that are in the, on the driving seat of this vaccination and all the stakeholders, as diverse as they are, so that perspectives will be shared and scientific knowledge will be passed down to all stakeholders to ensure that there's more acceptance of this vaccine. Uh, as at the last count, the last update we saw, 819,000 people have received this particular vaccine. And it's a race against time. We need to do more. And that means the states that are lagging behind actually need to step up the engagement to ensure that more people accept this vaccine. Now, one of the frequently asked questions, especially now, is how the COVID-19 vaccines tackle resistant variants. New research has found that the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines provide immunity for at least six months. So this clearly means that after six months, there is a possibility that immunity to the virus will reduce. What's your take with all of this latest development? Yes, uh, what we know so far is that it gives uh, protection for at least six weeks. And as knowledge continues to increase on this, we would know whether it can be more or people will need to receive the vaccine after a stipulated period again, a repeat after the first two doses that are normally given. And then for the issue of uh, the mRNA vaccines and dealing with the, the resistance strains. So far, that has been, to the relief of most people, it has been shown that those vaccines are active even against the resistant variants that we have seen. And as I have said it before on a program like this with you, is that even more research is being done to see that uh, scientists stay ahead of the curve. And before this particular 
uh, one is overtaken by the viruses in terms of mutation, maybe they would have something against it. So, so right now that anxiety is a bit down because uh, it's been shown that it's active against them. But what it actually shows that we need to do a lot more so that we can cover more people within a shorter time. If not, we will now have people who have received all their full doses six months later and we are still yet to cover certain segments of the society. And that's why we need to do more to ensure more people accept it quickly. We appreciate your time. Augustin Ajijadek is a pharmacist. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much, Millicent. Do have a pleasant evening. You as well. Meanwhile, staying on the continent, Mozambican President Felipe Nyusi has announced a nighttime curfew in all 10 of the country's provincial capitals for 21 days to stop the spread of COVID-19. Starting midnight today, the from uh, 10 to 4 uh, curfew will no longer be exclusive to the Greater Maputo the metropolitan region. The President is urging all Mozambicans to adhere to the measures put in place to prevent the spread so that life can return to normalcy soon. President Nyusi said the country must protect health professionals more and ease the impact of the third wave of the pandemic, which has been more severe in other countries. And in South America, where the variants in Brazil is driving up the number of infections, Uruguay and Paraguay registered record numbers of daily deaths, while the total number of COVID cases the past the 13 million mark in Brazil. Here's more on this and other stories in our global COVID-19 update. It appears Brazil's brutal surge in COVID-19 deaths will soon surpass the worst of a record January wave in the United States, climbing well beyond an average 3,000 fatalities per day. The overall death toll trails only the United States outbreak, with nearly 333,000 killed, according to the Health Ministry data, compared with more than 555,000 dead in the United States. The country's health system is at breaking point and could exceed total U.S. deaths despite having two-thirds the population. <laughs> Tanzania's new president, Samia Suluhu Hassan, has said her government would form a committee for scientific research into COVID-19 in a departure from the pandemic skeptic policies of her predecessor, John Magafuli, who died last month. Magafuli died of heart disease at the age of 61. He had dismissed the threat from the coronavirus pandemic, saying God and steam remedies would protect Tanzanians. He opposed mask wearing and social distancing and announced vaccines as part of a Western conspiracy to take Africans' wealth. And in the United States, new cases of COVID-19 rose 5% to more than 450,000 last week, the third week in a row that infections have increased. The average number of COVID-19 patients in hospitals rose 4% to more than 37,000 in the week ended April 4 breaking a streak of 11 weeks of falling admissions. Health officials were concerned about the increase in travel around the Easter holiday and school spring breaks at a time when more infectious variants of the coronavirus are circulating. Finally, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he wants a testing regime for international travel to be easy and cheap, hinting that rapid tests could be used after criticism from the airline industry that current requirements are onerous. He says while people have to be realistic over international travel resuming, the government was still targeting May 17, as the data would permit the public to again travel for recreational purposes. Earlier, he had said it was looking at the role of vaccination passports for overseas travel, which he thinks is going to be a fact of life. Continue to take responsibility. If you have symptoms associated with COVID-19, please visit one of the sample collection sites in your state to get tested. You can find uh, more updates on the pandemic, better understanding of it, on our website. It's channelstv.com. That's the program this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Minnesota Walker. Stay healthy.